Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of The Snapshot. We are your hosts. My name is Brendan Patrick, and I'm joined by none other than KM Best. The Snapshot is a Marvel Snap podcast focused on the competitive side of the game. And for episode 12, we're joined by TLSG, and we're we'll talking all about the new changes. So changes to card acquisition, matchmaking, infinite rank leaderboard, all that stuff. Let's get into it. All right, Cam, your week in Marvel Snap, sir. My week in Marvel Snap started with Master Mold, mm-hmm. who is fine, but limited. I gave him my my eventual review of Master Mold was he is a three out of five. Uh, not a card I would recommend you buy with collector's tokens. Uh, and outside of Master Mold, it then transitioned very swiftly to budget decks because I wanted to construct budget decks so that people would have not just a good idea of you know, what they could do early in pool three, but what they could do in pool three with, uh, you know, what they need to focus on given this new update, uh, one free pool three card a month spoilers, uh, what, what cards they need to focus on it. I constructed five budget decks and can you guess what card all five of them played? The budget decks. Yeah. Budget meaning series three only no series four, no series five. I think every deck would have arrow. That is correct. Ooh. That is, that is, you got it in Let's one. Let's go. <laughs> Every single one of them had arrow. So now I think what I'm going to do is I have to make no arrow versions of mm. them as well. That's a tough spot to be in. It kind of sucks, but it's, it's what you got to do if you want to like try to try to show what you can do on a budget. So I did something pretty similar this week, actually. I um, started a new account and I redid basically pull one, pull two um up to like rank 70 or something it's pretty much just pull one just to see what that free to play sort of new marvel snap experience was like i just want a little refresher and it's genuinely really fun i think that you play a ton of cheating bots <laughs> like even though they're not the gigabrain bots as they say or maybe they are you got electro a bunch didn't you yeah, they just they still yeah. cheat a lot, and I'm like, what the hell? I'm pl- I'm like yeah, rank twenty, and then, like this dude is like the bot is actually just like has a- the Ugh. yeah Electra Nightcrawler. When I was first playing with Jerry, was what tipped us off that they were cheating because mm-hmm. we'd play an Electra, they'd always move the Nightcrawler. They yeah. we would play something, and if they had uh, if they didn't have priority, they would always Electra it, and that's what that's what tipped us off to like the fact that there might be something going on behind the scenes in terms of the bots cheating. Yeah. Yeah. But um overall like that experience cuz I've I've been seeing a lot of content creators do the 0 to 100 kind of like speed race. And I was like is this, you know, what is this like? And yeah, I think that the Marvel Snap introductory experience is really fun. It's like you get getting those new cards is really cool. I I would just want to see what that 0 to 100 speed race is like and I I think that the people are correct when they say it's it's pretty dependent on what you open early. Like you want to get the Angela, you want to get the White Queen, the Sunspot, the Devil Dino. Um, but yeah, I uh, I wasted my time with that this week. <laughs> for what it's yeah, worth. you you you. It's not just dependent on what you un- open early, and it's dependent on how you are able to snowball into mm-hmm. bot Elo. How yeah. fast can you get there? Right? How fast are you going to be able to start playing only bots, and how reliably are you going to eight cube those bots? And that's the only thing it's about, and that sucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So for the news, we basically the main topic is going over all those changes to card acquisition, conquest mode, matchmaking. So we won't go over that now. Uh, we did have Master Mold release. You know, you talked about it, but it's a 2 2 and it says on reveal, add two Sentinels to your opponent's hand. Uh, you said three out of five. Um, yeah, probably. It might be a little high at three out of five, but I do feel like it's it's a better card than I expected. And that is like when I when I say three out of five, what I mean by three out of five is like fringe playable. Mm-hmm. Five is you need to buy this. Uh, four is this is a really good card. Five is this does some or three is this does some things. Mm-hmm. And I think Master Mold does do some things. It's just those things are very limited. And okay. then uh, two would be like this is probably making your deck worse. And one is uh, Shadow King. Interesting. So you know, on that scale, where would you rate Kang with Conquest Mode being you know coming into the game soon? And I know Kang's you- not a fair rate. Sorry. It's, it it's a series five card, so okay. it's by definition going to be a better buy than almost anything else in the entire true, uh, true. in the entire suite of series five cards. Do you think the stock of that card goes up in terms of playability uh, because of conquest? If yeah, in three months. Yeah, absolutely. It's mm-hmm. a better battle mode card than it is a ladder card. Yeah. It's an OK ladder card. 
Yeah. All right. So next up, we've got the bend and snap. This is a question from Fabled. Fabled says, what is your approach to tuning a deck? Many decks I have use one or two slots that aren't core cards, and I'm lost when it comes to choosing which version of a deck to use. I don't feel like <clears throat> I personally have the game count or uh, count experience or cubes to spare to really try out different options so i usually directly copy from a player better than me but i would love to hear your process and any tips you have for tuning and refining decks so what are you trying to do like that's that's actually literally it right like you look at a lot of death wave builds they run shang chi why do they run shang chi because shuri exists is that a good reason to run shang chi going forward you know maybe i mean it's a bad matchup regardless. Like, so for example, what I did recently in terms of tuning a deck, I took Death Wave and I was like, all right, look, the Shuri matchup sucks and this thing is probably getting nerfed anyway. So what if instead of playing the Shang-Chi out of deference to the theoretical situations in which they managed to not play Armor or Cosmo, which we lose to anyway, what if instead of doing that, we played Mr. Fantastic and Lizard so we could have priority more, which would help against a wider range of matchups? That's kind of what I did. Those are the two flex slots right now in my Death Wave deck. And do I know that that's right? No, I don't know that that's right, but it's definitely something worth investigating. There's nothing you can do if you don't try stuff. And if you don't have the, if you don't feel like you have the wherewithal to make these changes on your own, I mean, I think one, you need to work up the courage to do that and understand that if you want to be good, you need to try and fail. And two, I think, you know, net decking is a totally valid thing, but someone might build something a different way from you for these reasons. Like if you just went and got my Death Wave deck and you ran into Shuri and you're like, why am I not running Shang-Chi? You wouldn't understand why I was making the decisions that I've made. And I think that's also important when you're in a net deck is understanding what purpose the decisions in the deck serve. Mm. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's interesting. So I think when it comes to net decking and those, you know, those one to two slots for refining and tweaking, um, I think it comes down to a lot of the time relevancy and meta re relevancy, right? So if there is a Shang Chi in there for a specific reason, or let's say there's a tech card, but you know, you maybe got the deck a week later and the meta has adjusted, maybe that tech card's not the correct card, right? Maybe instead of you know, instead of running Shang Chi or instead of running like a Cosmo, um, let's say. Theoretically, let's say the Cosmo was there to target like a bunch of Wong decks walking around. And a week later, when yeah. you pick up this deck, there aren't any Wong decks. Well, I mean, you, you swap out that card now and you find a better tech card for the meta or you just find something synergized with your deck better. So that's that's where I see a lot of those sort of refining and 1C, 2Z. It's just like, what are you facing? What's really popular? And what do you think can increase, you know, increase your win weight right now? Yeah. And I'll be swapping out cards here and there all throughout my climb. And this is particularly important with a deck like, for example, Sarah. Like, there are maybe four core cards in Sarah right now, and everything else is just, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And it's not even just, like, your tech cards are this, right? Because you could run the destruction package if you're willing to say, you know, I'm not going to run into armor a lot. You could run armor if you want to, like, hard target death wave. Basically, every single card in Sarah, with the exception of, I would say, Sarah herself, Lizard... Killmonger and maybe and probably Arrow are mm. are not flex spots right now. And even even Arrow, I think normally would be a flex spot. I'm just of the belief that you should be playing her in in Sarah at this point. Mm. But you know, in previous meta games, even Arrow has been a flex spot. Yeah, and calling back to previous meta games and Sarah as well. One thing that Cam and I talked about in a previous pod was there's a lot of Sarah decks running around there that were, you know, they were running Nova Killmonger plus Silver Surfer plus like all this stuff to overinvest into the Brood Lane. And we like, I think in our opinion, it was like you can kind of cut those cards because you're winning the Brood Lane anyway, and it allows you to run more tech cards and be more flexible. And so I think that you can see a list that's it's a good list that people have been successful with it. But, you know, maybe you just have a different take. You're like, you know what? In the current meta, if I play Brood on a lane and I play Silver Surfer back when it was unnerfed, I just win that lane. So I, I don't need to I need to be worrying about the other two lanes right now. Yeah, there's like top line summaries of why you do a thing. And then there's, you know, the deeper nuances, the top line summary of why I wanted to put Lizard and Mr. Fantastic in Death Wave is because Death Wave really sucks when you don't blow up Bucky. If you're not blowing up Bucky, everything sucks. And why did why why does Death Wave sucks? Why does Death Wave suck when you're when you're not blowing up Bucky? Well, because you don't have priority. You're not putting a lot of big units onto the board. So what if we just played, you know, 
Mr. Fantastic, Lizard, Squirrel Girl. And like that was a, is a great way of taking priority. And it allows us to do Carnage Bucky on four without sacrificing, without running the risk of getting Cosmo or Armored. We can do that Bucky play later. Things like that. It, it opens up just a couple of different avenues that I'm hoping would be helpful, basically, to the deck. Because the major issue Death Wave has is, you know, it, it, it's a bad deck when it gets shut down by the tech cards. Because you're playing a bunch of cards that are not very strong, but suddenly you can play a reasonable priority game. And, you know, maybe your Killmonger kills something. Maybe your Deathlock kills something. Maybe your Carnage kills something. Maybe you played a Yondu. Suddenly you're doing a normal priority game, except you're playing Death Wave too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, Fable, that sort of answers our process for, for tuning decks. I would say, you know, just to reiterate, the number one for me is you know, what am I facing right now? And is there, if, you know, if there is a silver ball card that can come in and maybe the meta shifted from week one to week two, and, you know, the cosmos actually really good to have in my deck wasn't in there previously, you know, that's kind of the easy one card I'm going to swap out. And I think if I'm looking at a climb over a couple of days, or let's say, you know, multiple, multiple different ranks, it's very likely that I'll take a, you know, a single list of a single archetype and I'll be swapping out cards as I go. Cause like, honestly, the one card, you know, I think in something like Marvel snap where you can retreat, uh, you have a bit of flexibility to, you know, play a card and it doesn't work out. Boom. You go back to your old card and you're a better player for it. So that's, that's sort of an insight into our process. If you want to get your question read out on the podcast for the bend and snap uh, section, shoot us a comment on YouTube. I'll be sure to get that answered. And with that, let's go ahead and head, head into the main topic of the pod, which is all these new changes. And we'll be joined by none other than daily Marvel snap content creator and extremely nice guy, by the way, TLSG. The nicest man in niche internet card game content creation, TLSG. What's going on, y'all? Today on the Snapshot, we have TLSG, one of the biggest Marvel Snap YouTubers on the planet. One of, I, I think, probably the nicest people in the Marvel Snap scene. I still remember when I first started up my YouTube channel, when I first started doing content creation, out of nowhere, I'd never talked to this man before. He reached out to me and was like, hey... Is there anything I can do to help you? I'd love to help you. That's my TLSG impression. It was, it was, I still remember that. It was like genuinely meaningful. It was one of very few larger content creators at the time who like took the time to offer their assistance. And I guess now we're cashing that chip, that chip in. Here's TLSG on the snapshot. And I had a bunch of, for those who are not familiar with TLSG's format, what he does is he releases one deck video a day. A uh, video on a new deck build in Marvel Snap. And I am sort of fascinated by the premise of this, where we're releasing one deck a day. And so I think number one, my question, I, I have several questions all along this line, but the first one I want to know is how often do you find yourself having to repeat archetypes? Like once per month, once per two months? How often are you say, here's Electro Ramp? And then here's Electro Ramp with Sandman in it. Like, how often does that happen? It, it really depends on how big of a, a shift in a meta we see. But I think the, the shortest answer I could give is probably about, I start finding myself recycling about once a month for a handful. It's not that it recycles everything, but some stuff starts kind of cropping back up. So like the Patriot builds, the Cerebro 2 builds, those are that are very consistent. Um, it's like almost bringing those back to the forefront that these are still viable. Um, outside of that, the the original premise came from the mystery cards. So as we were all in beta days unlocking cards from pool three, I wanted to challenge myself to use those that were perceived as bad cards. And um, I, I kind of just stuck with that format after I finished the collection. It definitely got more challenging. But depending on when balance patch comes through, uh, it's about it's it's about recycling once a month or so that uh, that I kind of run out of ideas and I have to go back to the drawing boards of like what haven't I covered in a while that's still definitely viable and should be should be covered. What would you say the bottom bar is in terms of viability that a deck has to pass in order for it to be featured on your channel? Because I know your channel is like like. So often I'll see something in Discord that'll be like, why is everyone doing this? And the answer is TLSG released a video where they were do where he was doing this. So uh, like, what is 
Because I, I know that your decks are of a level that they influence the metagame, of a level that smart players pick them up, of a level that I, even I will run into people who are playing TLSG decks, right? And so what's your minimum bar? Like, do you ever cut a video and then you're just like, this just isn't a good enough deck? So I, I don't have a minimum bar. It's a lot, it's a lot more on feeling, but it's, it's definitely more of a more than 50%. I want it to be as consistent, have multiple play lines so that it's not all on one. It's, it's not like, like an Exodia combo. It's not leaning on just one gambit. Um, but typically for every deck that I showcase, it's about two or three that I experiment with that I'm like, this just doesn't work. Like even if it worked for somebody else that, you know, I, I know makes good decks, if it doesn't have that, that feel, that cohesiveness or just, for whatever reason, I'm not able to pilot it to that level, um, then it won't end up making the cut. So I'd probably say like mid 50s, like 55% is what I would kind of guesstimate most of what I showcase would end up kind of falling on, on that bar. So since you're releasing daily, what does your routine look like to be able to get these videos out and maybe go through the process of I'm sure some days are harder than others in terms of you you boot up, you're looking for a deck and you're like, mm, this one's not really doing it or you haven't gotten maybe the, the games you want to showcase the deck. What, is, what does that daily routine look like? Uh, so as far as daily routine, uh, it's chaotic. Um, so in addition to the, the daily build, build just in, in terms of like everything all in, in terms of like the daily build, the stream, I have a full-time job as well. And so it's juggling a lot of those pieces. And so there's testing, usually later at night, whenever I'm winding down, I'm thoroughly ad addicted to Marvel Snap. And so while I'm winding down, I'll be playing games. Even if I streamed for five, six hours, I'm still experimenting and brewing with different things. It, it has shifted over time as we've started getting more and more talented deck builders into the game. Not that in beta days, we, we didn't have the talent, but there's so much larger of a player base that I think it's, I, I can't say that, you know, everything I would build would match up to the quality that, you know, other people provide. Mm -hmm. But I do lean on other creators and I, I kind of give credit. It's really hard to give credit for, for deck builds with 12 cards in them. But I do try and give credit where, where credit's due. So if I pull a, a list from, you know, Snapfan or untap.gg or something that ran well in a recent tournament, I can lean on those inspirations um, now compared to beta days where it was just all me. Um, so I guess it's a long way to, to answer your question. I apologize. Um, I guess in short, I will typically look at any kind of archetypes or things that I think might attack the current metagame. So like right now is always Thanos and Shuri. I'm building a deck. Can it hold up to those two decks? Um, and then if I'm just out of ideas, then I'll start looking around at those other sites, looking at stats, looking at things that are performing well, and then trying to like refine it, own it, make it my own in some way. And in some cases, it's just a, a copy paste and then, you know, give credit for the build to, to that creator. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot of testing those different builds, because if I pull one and copy and paste it, I want to put it through the paces before I just record games and slap it on the channel. And so I want to make sure that it, it can match up to a, a wide variety of, of different decks and builds. What are your thoughts on deck diversity in Marvel Snap and um, mostly in regards to how it's progressed since whenever you started playing the game? Do you feel like uh, the sort of top decks or the best decks in Marvel Snap has started to converge onto a couple decks or even a couple cards that everything seems to be built around that maybe are in a way fundamentally more powerful than some of the other things you could be doing? And So I... I, I, I do and I don't. So a lot of that, I think, comes down to what the current balance is at that time. So there were a couple of times in the beta, in early beta, um, a Nova Carnage polarized the game. And it was super early on. Nobody had deep collections, but that was by far the best deck that you could run. And then later on, there was a negative serotonin that just you couldn't go more than two matches without running into that particular deck. And it was the same build every single time. So I think it's come in waves. Um, I think right now we're seeing one of those waves with the Thanos and the Shuri, which hopefully kind of is brought down into not oblivion, but something that can still be played just doesn't feel as uh, bad to play against. 
Um, so I think it comes down to like the balanced cadence and whenever those different clusters of good cards kind of start cropping up and how quickly they can be addressed. Mm -hmm. I do wonder, because like you look back in retrospect at a lot of the things that dominated the beta and, you know, a bunch of them were predicated on just, you know, turn six magic makes counterplay really difficult. But I do wonder if we missed some of these archetypes that could have matched up well into them. Like one of the things that I think about a lot is Arrow. And obviously, you know, Arrow's phenomenal now. She probably would have been good as the five, six she was in the beta in the context of at least Death Wave, which was a deck that people ran. And she just wasn't really even seeing play in Death Wave. And I think that like, like if even if you, you even if you're one of the people who says like, OK, well, Arrow wasn't seeing play because the metagame involved Sarah Dex putting 12 cards on the board, right? She probably should have still been in Death Wave. And she just sort of wasn't. And it's just one of those things where it's like. I don't know exactly if we were all just worse back then. I do think we likely were or if just. Like, because, like, the the whole concept of the leader archetype, right, where you just take priority, then play these cards, it didn't exist, and it could have, I feel like. These priority decks could have existed and just didn't. And that's, like, a whole aspect of the game that we basically never got to during the beta. And I think that is really remarkable. The beta was so much more two ships uh, passing in the night. How does my Patriot deck match up against your Mr. Negative deck? We're both doing our linear thing and putting a bunch of points everywhere than it was. Like, the closest we got to interaction was we'd play Magic Carnage, right? We'd play, like, Magic, Enchantress, Chang chi and swing games on the last turn. And that was as close as we got. And I, I kind of wonder if it was that just what it had to be because of turn six Magic, or did we actually just miss these archetypes? I think there's definitely probably a, a, a bit of both. Um, so we've been able to play the game longer. We have a, a bigger player base that can influence those deck builds. I think another important piece in the beta days is earlier, earlier on anyways, a lot of people weren't pull three complete. And so we were making do with what we had. And so experimentation was still kind of tough at, at that point too. Mm -hmm. But I, there, think, I so. think there there were definitely a couple builds that I look back on that I brewed from the daily builds, and I was like, "This this isn't even this even this isn't even good." <laughs> I, I can't believe I put this out. I remember I have one specifically. I wrote a deck about a deck I like to call Hurricane Control. It was like a wave Sandman Zola Black Widow thing, and like I loved it, and I it was good for it was even it was playable for exactly one week, and then they nerfed Arnim Zola or not Arnim Zola, they nerfed Ronan. And then it's like, oh, well, the deck fell apart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Immediately fell apart. Uh, I still use some of the things that I use in that in that deck. It's like it was like a it's like a Zola Ronin wave Black Widow Doom Odin deck. So you had like a bunch of different like little weird combos where you'd go like Black Widow wave Odin or you'd go like uh, wave Zola Odin and you'd, you'd, you'd do all that uh, kind of weird stuff. But you also had like your normal curve out Ronin strategy. But looking back on it, it's like. Those weird little combos didn't do anything. Curving out into Ronin does stuff. <laughs> like, curving out into Ronin, playing Doctor Doom into Odin, that's what does things. The, the other stuff, eh, I don't know. <laughs> like, it offers a little disruption to the opponent, but for the most part, yeah. Because I, I remember getting Black Widow and trying the exact same thing. I was like, this is going to be amazing. And then you realize that over the course of the game, you put like 10 points on the board. You're mm -hmm. like, well, maybe that doesn't. Maybe that doesn't. Maybe that was up. bad. Yeah. Perhaps I should have done more than that. Perhaps right, I should yeah. have put more than 10 points on the board. Right. TLC, what are your thoughts on the current um <clears throat> the current card release uh schedule, cadence, and cost? Like its ability to impact the, the game because of its sort of prohibitive uh level of cost. And what do you think about the cadence where we're getting multiple new cards per month? So if we're not seeing um, like big big releases or expansions like normal card games. I like the idea of it slowly kind of drip feeding those cards in. It gives you time to interact with the card. But that, at that point, it, with the restrictive cost, you very rarely see a new card. So then, <clears throat> then you have just a handful of creators that are brewing around this deck and brewing around this card, and it kind of comes down to what their experiences were if that card kind of sees further consumption. At least from from my experience, came. I don't know if you have the the same one, but 
um, like for Master Mold. Most of the people were like, ah, it's a lot that you have to put into it. So it's not necessarily worth the 6,000. And so then people don't adopt it versus I think Kang, there was just a lot of hype for it that just people jumped in, even though it's, I, th I think, a pretty, pretty bad card in its current state. Um, you, you see a lot more Kang in the game because of how, how hyped it was, how excited everyone was. Well, on my end, the creators seemed to be for that release. I saw much more Kang than I, I, I will ever see of Master Mold, I think. Mm -hmm. and I think that's you, you true. Look like, but yeah, you look like you have a, you well, have a thought. Kang, Kang's not getting downgraded. So that's that makes true. it a much safer purchase for all these people. It takes sure. like the threshold to clear for a card that's not getting downgraded out of Series 5 is so much lower than the threshold you have to clear for like effectively paying 3,000 tokens to get Master Mold two months early. Like that, that like, like I, I think, you know, Kang, Kang was hyped, yes, because of the creators, yes. But also, he's kind of useful, especially if you're going to play in battle mode ever. And, like, he costs 6000 and always will. He's right. one of the only three cards in the game that is not a fundamentally depreciating investment. He's one of the only three cards in the game that you, it's not like a car where you drive it off the lot and suddenly it costs half of what you just paid for it. Like, it's... I think that matters more than people the actual think card. it does. Yeah. Not necessarily more than the actual card, but, like, more than people think it does in the sense of, like, players do not want to be screwed over and like they like and and, and being regarded and and the price right now of a, a series five card i think a lot of players just regard that as screwing them over why would they ever pay that when they could pay six thousand for something that won't ever go down in value like it i i think that that's a big part of why a big bad release would be hyped in a way that basically no other card would. I mean, we'll see with Kitty Pride, who is someone I have a lot of hope for, iconic character, super cool card, probably the best card being released this month if I just had to eyeball it. Not that my eyeballs are particularly reliable, they're <laughs> just eyeballs. But like, I uh, I guess we'll see in terms of Kitty Pride. If you see a ton of Kitty Pride, I mean, it might just be because she's cool or fun or unique. But we know she's being downgraded, and I I wouldn't expect you to see anywhere near as much Kitty Pride as Kang unless she's like the best card in the game. That's true. And so I think even that would come a couple weeks after release, um, just yeah. for people to really see it in game, experience it, see what other like, perceptions of it are. And so I I, I think you make some some good points. <sighs> And I hear that that argument a lot about the six thousand, and if they should buy, you know, Galactus, if they should buy Kang, and I, from an investment standpoint, yes, yeah. <laughs> like it's the only thing that, like you said, is not depreciating. I always try to urge people that if it's not a like, I bought Galactus. I don't like the Galactus playline. I think he's a fine card. I think he has a, a a decent place, but it's very it's a very boring archetype for me, and so I always try to urge people to like really take in that card and even though it's always going to be 6,000 if it's a 6,000 card that you just don't like at that point even if your other card would have depreciated it's not worth the 6,000 mm -hmm. yeah I think but no I, I think that's I think true we, but I like I honestly sometimes I feel like the audience for people like us uh, there's something I hear a lot which is like people will always given the opportunity min max the fun out of their own games and I feel like that's a lot of the audience that we have, which is just like people who are like, I want to do the best thing. I That's it. I just want to do the smartest and best thing. And so, like, if someone comes to me and is like, should I buy Galactus or literally any other Series 5 card? Frankly, I think they probably should buy Galactus. The only the only misgiving I have is, man, I really don't want to see more Galactus. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't want that to happen. But like, if someone asks you for an honest opinion, yeah, you should probably buy Galactus. It's not necessarily going to be the best deck. I think it's been pretty consistently tier two for the last like two months. It's a little boring. I don't know what it says about me that I enjoy playing Nimrod Galactus. Uh, you can psychoanalyze that if you want, but I, I, it's I a little think... boring. But like, it, it gives you a sense of inevitability that basically no other deck in the game gives you. And I think a lot of people do enjoy that. Brandon. Yeah, yeah, I was just saying Kang's my favorite card oh. in the game. So. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so the funny thing with Kang too is I think that it's like it's a unique effect, right? So you can't you can't really get that experience out of any other card. Maybe Daredevil gets you close. Um and 
I think that players have have had fun with that card. And it's not immediately apparent that Kang is bad when Kang is bad, you know? Like a lot of the lists you can slot him yeah. into where he makes it marketably worse because of the opportunity cost of having your deck. You still get to play the effect sometimes. You're like, that feels good every time. I think there are decks where Kang is, you know, he is impactful and he is good. Uh, where the turn six, you know, the turn six text card, tech card makes you lose instantly or something like that. Kang can be good, but outside of that, yeah, I don't know. I, at TLSG, I want to ask you in regards to Series 5 cards, in the current model, what power level do you think they should be? Should they be should they be really good cards? Should they be borderline overpower cards? Or should they be sort of, you know, archetype supporting cards, things that slot into already good decks or maybe developing archetypes? Or should they be, I don't know, maybe less powerful? So things like like Master Mold or like I don't know. We can say like Ghost and things like that, or Shadow King, your, your the card that you said you said you bought earlier. What what power level do you think is appropriate for series five? So I don't know that I have a set power level that that feels good. I think if their if their release schedule is all cards in series five, there's going to have to be some that are just not great. I think the ones that are more powerful should probably be, well, it, it's it in my opinion should be on like the 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 season pass more people can access them but i think that's maybe a little bit different than what second dinner's model or the snap model might be um but i think what feels really bad is whenever we don't have a lot of like changes and there's a fairly stale meta state you can't really brew as well with those new cards without feeling immediately punished so i slot this card into my deck i slot shadow king and i just get obliterated and there's just no way to really try to refine or re like, i guess hone in on what deck that might be good without just taking a big string of l's a majority of the time if their power level is a little bit better so master mold's not quite as bad mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit easier to utilize but i i think i think the releasing them in series five if we have better acquisition is is okay mm -hmm. um, i don't think it has to be broken i think if it is only really strong cards going to five. I have a bigger issue than a ghost or a master mold going to five and then downgrading over time because then that's going to feel much more locked behind that paywall than people saying, "Oh wow, you, I'm sorry, you wasted six thousand on a Shadow King. I, I feel bad for you." I I would much rather that than them say, "All right, you're just paying your way to win." Exactly. Um, yeah, we're dealing with uh, you know two issues on separate sides. The releasing only the best cards at Series Five. We do run ourselves directly do a pay to win scenario and then releasing bad cards in series five you have these cards that you know they come out and then players just don't engage with them they wait for their content creators to buy them they see they're not good enough they don't you know they just wait and i think that that's probably a better system i do have a question for both you and cam since you're both content creators you both do twitch you both do youtube do you get negative feedback on some of your videos with the newer series five cards because it's not something i experienced because i only do this podcast yes. for marvel snap but i have heard that the <laughs> <laughs> like for some reason videos containing new cards just freaking piss people off uh i don't even know if it's negative feedback but if you go to my youtube right now i do i do approximately three videos a week and the one that does the worst is new card video by an enormous enormous margin because like people might be looking for you know nimrod decks or uh you know master mold decks but i will tell you this the thing that i do and i think this is like my fault as a content creator because i i won't say i'm too honest but i will say i won't show them bad things and that means that a lot of my decks that i would say like here are nimrod decks they're not going to be creative like that. When I say that, like I, I, I will not go out on a limb in one of these videos. Mm -hmm. I will, I will show exact, like with Nimrod, it was really stark. It was like, what are the good Nimrod decks? Uh, Nimrod Galactus, uh, Nimrod Red Skull, uh, like, like, like just, just, just awful. Right. And of those, the only one I actually thought was good. And I, I made sure to say this in the, the only one I thought actually Nimrod actually made the deck better was Nimrod Galactus. And my Nimrod Galactus build cost uh, approximately $10 million. And now that is just, you know, I don't know if you know this, but $10 million is not an attainable amount for most people. I, I I'm built a little different, but yeah, I got a lot of comments on like, how am I ever supposed to play this? Can't wait to play this in 2024. Can't wait to play this in 2025. I, like that happens a lot. I I think my community 
being both smaller and I think maybe a little more curated because of that than TLSGs is a little less likely to give me those comments, but it's not like I still don't see them. And, and from my side, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a very positive community. Um, I don't get a lot of the like, like angry or just like pinpointed uh, comments very often. They do still make their way in. Um, but from a Series 5 standpoint, I will typically buy it. I will release a video on, on day one of release, and then I won't touch the card again until it's probably Series 4 or something just meta-breaking comes up. Um, and so like Thanos, I didn't do a build for Thanos for probably two months after he was released, um, just because it doesn't appeal to as many viewers as like series three or maybe light series four content. Um, and so I think because of that, that curbs some of that negativity that might come with those series five builds. Um, but I, I think it's definitely something that is prevalent in the creator's mind. So like I have stature and I, I'm very intrigued by stature. I think stature is can be a decent value card. I haven't really brewed with stature after release because there most people aren't going to be able to see that card for you know three months, maybe even more if it's not worth spending those those extra tokens on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I've heard that there's uh, I don't know. I've seen different uh, different rhetoric on sort of the trade off between you know whether the series five uh, five card videos actually perform better but they get negative feedback or if like you know, if it's even worth it to do it but it is weird that we're in the situation where we're releasing cool new cards like a card game that's releasing a new card every week that's kind of awesome and i think that most other card games i've played have had massive content droughts in between sets so like this is the ideal scenario but releasing them in a in a case in a in a way that most of the community can't actually engage with them. It's kind of this weird non bow. And I'm just like, mm, I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. Um, yeah, it puts a, it puts a weird divide on like the new cards and like utilizing those without feeling a little bit of guilt for like, I spent this, but next week kitty pride's coming out. Mm -hmm. So you always have that like potential, like buyer's regret mm -hmm. um, almost mm -hmm. immediately. If you don't actually enjoy the, the card once it, once it comes down. Yeah, well, I put my money where my mouth was in one of our pods, and I, I bought Ghost on day one, and it was a, <coughs> not a good, not a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the toughest video for me to do a day one release. Like normally, I try to get decent games. Uh, it it was a descent into madness. The entire video. It was I've awful. never seen her be good. I've only no, seen no. her be bad. Like I've only seen her be like, ah, well, I played this Ghost, which means now I can't do X. <laughs> <laughs> Never see her actually do the thing you want her to do. Yeah, I, I thought she, I, I thought it was going to be pretty strong too, Brendan. Like, <laughs> I, I was I was very off. I very just thought, off with that one. Yeah, I just thought it was unique, and you know, maybe as like a one drop, she it could, reads yeah. so strong. Yeah, it and reads then she like, plays so bad. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of tough to compete with Sunspot in that spot too. It's like, ugh. all right. So we had a we had a ton of news come out uh, this week. I'm going to go ahead and read through some of it. I just want to get your reactions, your thoughts. I mean, a lot of this looks like changes that we've been asking for. They look like very positive changes. But I think with this news specifically, you can do a bit of reading between the lines and some stuff was left out. <laughs> so uh, first off is Conquest. So Conquest is effectively battle mode, um, but for ranked. I'm very surprised about this, to be honest. I didn't think that they would actually sort of segregate the, the ranked ladders. I don't think it's a bad thing, but I am surprised. So we are going to have our own sort of version of ranked for conquest, which is effectively battle mode, something that goes with like tickets and you're going from league to league. If you win, I think it's like three in a row. Um, what are your thoughts on conquest as a ranked mode? And I forgot to mention some of the, you get seasonal rewards. There's like a seasonal exclusive variant. So there is incentive to doing this. What are your first reactions to this, um, to this announcement of conquest being a, a ranked mode? It's dope. I wonder if, I mean, my major question is, you know, how do I get tickets? Yeah. How do I, like, if I fail my, my bronze promos or whatever, which I will, <laughs> how do I do them again? How do I, how do I acquire those? Do I have to pay for that? Is it like arena where you just try to go infinite in, in Hearthstone? Is it like that? Is it like leagues in magic where there's a fee to enter? I don't, I'm interested to know what the monetization model of this mode is, I think is my number one question, because if it's the kind of thing where you can just pick up and play and you can try to level up at any time you want, that sounds phenomenal. 
All you got to do is win three in a row. Just run yourself at it till you win three in a row. That sounds great. Uh, if, if it's the kind of thing where you have to pay a like gold entry fee, I don't know if people are going to find it a good use of that gold. I don't know if it'll acquire the player base that it might need to acquire in order to... Someone brought up the idea of bots in Conquest, bots mode, in which Conquest. is just like the most horrifying thing I've ever even thought of. I didn't even think about it until someone brought it up. And I was like, there's no... There's like I just assumed like there's no way, right? But uh, I guess there's not no way. <laughs> and so like if the if it doesn't get a player base, that is like a now it, it immediately skyrocketed to the top of my of my fear list. Like I you know that comic where the guy is wearing a shirt that says no fear, and then someone says something and then he's wearing a shirt that says one fear. Bots in conquest mode is that one fear for me. Like that that's it. So if there's two things that I could um I would speculate on from what you said. First, I would speculate that it is pay to play. So it is gonna be like you buy a ticket, you get in. Um the reason I think this is because the victories, they grant medals, which you can use in exclusive rewards, like the conquest shop, stuff like that. So these are specific cosmetics for that that shop. So I think it's pay to play to acquire variants. Uh, you know, you're risking sort of your performance on that. Um, I also think that there's hundred percent going to be bots. The reason is, is I don't think that, Mar I think that Marvel snap has shown that they will avoid queue times and the possibility of you not getting a queue at all costs. And we've seen that with this like very, very narrow matchmaking parameters that we currently have to an absolute fault. Like it has its benefits, right? You queue, you play like almost immediately, but it really breaks down at some of the higher ranks. It definitely breaks down in infinite where you have people like Cam plays monobots. That's also a symptom of hidden, hidden MMR. But I think that almost certainly uh, for there to be fast queues or for them to be as fast as they want them, there will probably be bots in conquest. That sucks. I really hope they're not. <laughs> what do you <laughs> think, TLSG? <laughs> so, so Mr. Positivity over here, I didn't have any of these concerns, and now I do. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly, I, uh, <laughs> like, that's exactly how I was. So Someone I, I, said it on Twitter. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> so I saw consider it, this. I saw it, and I was like, this is uh, amazing. Like, this mode sounds fantastic. Like, and I was thinking, you start at the lowest rank. That's your, in my head, it was free entry. I hope. I hope it's free entry at the bottom tier and like you work, work your way up whenever you lose. You might have to go back and get another ticket from that bottom tier. That's how I hope it happens. That's what I read. But I could honestly see it being the pay to play as well. If it's variants that they're investing time and resources into being exclusive, I could, I could see it potentially being pay to play. And then bots I didn't even think about. That makes the whole conquest thing. Because then whenever you get to infinite, if there's no infinite players, are you playing against the like the the clairvoyant bots that just feel awful to play against because if, if i winning two out of three and then losing the third on like a bot professor x sounds like an actual nightmare especially mm. if it's pay to play like it, uh, maybe i can swallow it if it's free and i'm just yeah. kind of grinding through but if it's pay to play and i paid 500 gold and then i go into a just nobody would ever play cosmo on the last turn as their only drop priority drop and it blocks my last turn effect uh, yeah, that would that would be worse than I think anything else I could imagine has happened in Snap, and I could see yeah. a lot of like bad uh, mm -hmm. bad backlash I, from it. I mean, that is like that is basically just the developers robbing you. It's a scam. Like I don't know a better way <laughs> to put like, it, right? Like like it's it's ba like if you run into a clairvoyant bot and you lose to that clairvoyant bot, you're being robbed if you paid to play. <laughs> like, that is. And that, 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 like, I guess it's like, I guess it's, you know, it's really not. I think on average, it's probably better. Uh, one other thing I'm interested in is we're looking at three wins in a row, which mm -hmm. sort of takes the snapping mechanic out of it a little bit. What's going so, on with that? So that so works with the battle mode, right? Like it's still, it's the health. Yeah. It's three health. battle mode wins in a row. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes way more sense. I was like, really? And, and I think with, hopefully, and again, in my positive uh, outlook, hopefully because it's battle mode, it doesn't have to have those lower queue times because they're going to expect people to not be playing while they're running to the restroom, while they're in between. Like It doesn't have that three-minute limitation. So mm -hmm. at that point, maybe they can afford longer queues. They eliminate bots because of that. But I think that all is still yeah. predicated on if it's pay-to-play, I mean, if we have enough people playing it. Apologies for the brain fart earlier about it being battle mode. I did know that, I swear. But I can a bot even play battle mode? Like, are we, or would a bot playing battle mode just 
do the same things a normal bot would do, which is, you know, snap one as a head on five, that kind of thing. Definitely. Like, same would, thing. It, would it just would it just be doing that? I've mm. never I've never even thought about it. I, I really I really truly I pray that this is not an eventuality that comes to pass. Oh, I'm not a religious man, but I'll become one. For oh, this. you sweet summer child. <laughs> these bots are these bots are come. Um, but like, OK, <laughs> playing the bots sucks anyway. Imagine being locked in a battle mode with a bot. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> I've even more time doing it. I have a question for both of you. Assuming that you've achieved the rank that you want to, you want to for the season, and all else is equal in regards to your Q times, your your level of opponents. Let's say no bots. Are you playing battle? Are you playing conquest or are you playing regular ranked? What do you think is going to be the mode for you? All else being equal, like these are kind of similar. Con- conquest for me. I think conquest is. Yeah, there's exclusive rewards for it. And so mm-hmm. I've hit my rank in the regular ladder. If there's not anything else to attain besides like a leaderboard rank ranking or ranking up your uh, like the the rating that they the skill rating that they um, mentioned, I think I'm grinding in conquest. I think those are going to be closer to like a tournament setting. So I think it in my head, anyways, it, it feels like it would be a bit more competitive once you get to the top, to the higher end of it, which I think could help kind of keep the engagement in the mode. Um, I would think my answer to this question. I want to be where the people are, uh, to quote the little mermaid. I want to be, I want to be where the people are. And so whatever mode I compete in, I, I, sorry, this is going to be a bit of a long winded answer. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I'm so optimistic on the Hearthstone Grandmasters coming into this game and doing well is because I think the fundamental measure of what maybe not like this, this might not be an exact theorem, but the more people play your game, the harder it is to be the best at it. Right. And so these Hearthstone players have already come from a place where more people play their game and like they have already shown dominance in that you'll notice like if you go to hearthstone like people kind of make fun of wild legend because it's not the same wild legend wild rank one legend not the same as getting it in standard because standard has more players it's harder to do right and that is something that i think about with this here right i would never want to be playing in the marvel snap equivalent of wild you know That's just not what I want. I want to be playing in the hard mode. That's what I want to do. And if that's ladder, that's what I'm going to do. If that's conquest, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go where it's harder. And I think for me, that me, that mostly means where the more people are. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some exceptions to this. I think you could probably argue that like magic online is harder than magic arena. Uh, because that's where like the true degenerate grinders all are. You have to compete in like a 448 person PTQ. That's actually a PTQ that queues you for another PTQ. It, yeah. It's tough, right? The like like things like from that. 1990. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And so like there are some exceptions to my general rule of where the people are is where the hard mode is. But I think that's kind of like if I think that's kind of what will inform my decision. Yeah. Where are the killers at? Because I have to be one like i have to play that i can't be one unless i iron sharpens iron and if i'm playing in the sandbox which i have been for the past three months it sucks i'm gonna be so unsharp (laughs) i'm gonna be dull and i i just i don't know if maybe conquest really catches a hold of me but fundamentally i'm gonna go where the people are yeah so just want to talk about card acquisition changes. I'm just going to go ahead and read this out. So they're saying more tokens. We're increasing the amount of tokens earned on the collection level track for all players who have not collected all series four and series five cards. Sergeant collection level 500 will be able to earn between 200 and 600 tokens and collector caches and collectors or reserves, regardless of whether they have completed series three or not. This is an increase of four X for players who have not yet completed series three. Once a card series is complete cash caches that would have uh, contained a card from that series will now be replaced with 100 tokens all these changes will result in more tokens for more people more people so i mean this is pretty much just across the board a good change would you have liked to see any more changes on top of this and do you think that it's enough so i think kind of coupled with that um i think there's been some some 
talk about series three being removed from the token shop, which I think mm -hmm. for a series three non complete player, you're getting more tokens, but now you can't spend those on key cards. You get one free card pool per month. But if I, I think in terms of those that are just getting into the game, it might be a little bit of a step back as far as being able to have that autonomy in what cards you want. Yes, you get more tokens, so you'll have to engage with the newer cards. But if they're not the like the core cards, so like if Arrow keeps dodging me and I'm not Series 3 complete, right now that feels really bad. Um, and I'm going to have to go in and use a, get a I know, Bast, a Hawk, um, like those that you still need several Series 3 cards to be able to pilot and make valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a really good change. Um, but with that, I think there's a, a small caveat that could potentially be a bad change for those that they're wanting to target, which seems like those that haven't been in the game as long is kind of uh, helping them catch up to rest the rest of the cards. They get more tokens overall. Yeah, here so, so it says choose your cards. Series three cards now have their own section in the shop. Once per season, players who haven't completed series th three will be able to claim one free series three card to help them fill out their favorite deck. Yada yada yada. So does this mean you just get the one per month and yes, like that's all you that's see? What it means. Okay, so that's you don't have this road. Confirmed. Okay, okay. I've been I've been trying to figure this out, or I guess this idea, this whole thing has been percolating in my brain for a while. So like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> what? It's a that's a that's like a KMism is a percolate. <laughs> I'm sorry, I took the SAT, Brendan. <laughs> I think it's a great word. I just love it every time <laughs> it comes up. <laughs> no, I, yeah, this this has been this has been uh, swirling around my brain for a while, where I. I just I I don't know how to feel about it. My initial reaction to this was, oh, my God, you are fumbling the bag so hard. Mm. Like, why would you make this a thing? Why would you? But I get it. I get why they did it. My first reaction was, this is a terrible idea. You made you took what should have been a home run update and you made it into a, a long single. Right. Like uh, it just landed on the warning track. It was almost there. Nothing. And. Now I kind of get it. It's been sitting there for a couple of days. I get what they're going for, because if everyone got all those extra cards, what would happen is all of the series three progression from like rank 700 on would be uh, net deck mirrors forever. That's all it would be like. It would be it, like once you get the tokens, you buy arrow, you buy Sarah, and then you have Sarah and arrow. And you play whatever decks you want with Sarah and Arrow. You buy whatever supporting card you want. And if you're getting a four to six hundred every like four boxes, you're going to be able to do that by approximately rank, I don't know, 800. And you're just mm -hmm. going to be doing that. And you're going to be playing that deck until you're rank 3500. And I get what they're going for with making that harder to do, even though what they chose to do reduces player agency significantly. I, I have long been of the opinion that, you know, Marvel Snap is held back by its collection system rather than buoyed by it. The game itself is phenomenal, and the collection system could be basically uh, straight ripped off from any other card game, and people would probably let the game flourish a little bit more than this current collection system mm -hmm. does. Which is hilarious, if, but yeah, I mean... Yeah. Just yeah. it's hilarious because I remember there was a game called Duelist Two that came out. Uh, it was relaunched basically, and it they couldn't allegedly they couldn't recode the sort of collection system, so it had like a little Hearthstone level collection system with the dusting and stuff like that. And people just ripped that game apart because they're like, "This is so outdated. It's archaic." And it's funny because in Marvel Snap, if they just gave us like like a Hearthstone level collection system, it would be infinitely more accessible. <laughs> Which is just like, yeah. like Marvel Snap has gone so far out of its way to just be unattainable and just like a, they need a tough to process. Get, a, get over it. They need to get over it. They need to get over this unique collections thing. They need to get over it. It's like that's the driving force behind why they made this change. Is I'm assuming they just didn't want people to be playing net decks, but it's like dog. Mm -hmm. People want to win. You made a game that people want to invest in winning, and you're not letting them do that. You're not letting these people make correct investments in winning games of Marvel Snap that they want to play. Like, it's like the people will always min max the fun out of their games. And it's like, why do you think they do that? They don't, they don't, it doesn't mean you need to stop them from min maxing the fun out of their games. They want to do that because that's what they think is fun. They want to win. 
winning is fun and you designed the game so that winning is fun obviously like hearthstone was actually especially good at this uh the ui made it so losing felt awful and winning felt amazing marvel snap is a little bit worse at it but like like the 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 music the victory like they they like you designed the game to make winning fun and then you're surprised when people want to win more. I don't really get that. Like, I just think I, I wish they would just let the people who want to win try as hard as they can to win. Yeah. I mean, I've talked about this before and I think we kind of disagree on it, but I, I'm a bit cynical in the sense that I just, I, at this point, don't actually think that they believe in that ideology of unique collections lead to a, a more fun game. I mean, I think that the collection... Uh, the card acquisition from series one to series two and maybe series three is like actually phenomenal, like the free to play. But after that, like every card game, every, especially every digital card in the history of ever has people want to play with cards. They want access to the cards and especially they want access to the best cards. They want to be able to compete with good decks. When I lose to a card that I don't have, it's not, it's going to make me feel not just bad, but really freaking bad. It's going to, piss me off and i just i think that when they keep they keep saying like unique collections are cool they're fun it's like no they're not because these players the players that don't that have the unique collections right they don't have all the cards they don't have the good cards it doesn't feel very unique to them they're just losing to the same deck over and over again and they just can't get it and that sucks i will also say though i do think this change is good for one other thing um getting the series four and five cards into early decks should create some really entertaining deck building opportunities. Like, I think I'm really interested to see with, for example, what people come up with for Kitty Pride. If you're not full collection, she might actually just be a great bot. Like, you might be able to get a lot done with her. She could be really cool. I'm interested in that. And like, I do think it, what it does is creates this thing where there will be more series four and five cards running around in early collection levels without necessarily 100% proper support. And I think that makes the game a little more fun and a little more unique. And I definitely I get what they're going for here. Like, I get it. Like, it makes sense if you consider it from that perspective. I just don't share that perspective. But I do get it more than I did when I first saw this. When I first saw this, I was like, you know, if you just didn't do that, I think everyone would love you forever. Well, that was that was my first reaction to this change. Yeah, and I, 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 I get like you said, I get what they're targeting. They're targeting the fact that cards that are newly released feel unattainable. Mm -hmm. But to do that, it sacrificing being able to net deck in series three. Which, to be fair, uh, I usually encourage people to not buy too many series three cards because um, you're gonna get them over time. And so maybe the one a month is enough. Maybe we're being a little bit too harsh on it because usually you're only going to pick up a handful once you're a decent way into series three. I, I don't know. I don't know. But it just it reads bad. It reads less autonomy over your over your your collection and over your game, which I think is is bad overall. I like, got again. I don't necessarily like the every collection is unique once you get to, to end game people at, at that point your buy-in is that you want to be competitive you want to be mm -hmm. you know trying to be able to win like you said yeah like earlier on i think it's really cool like brendan said just pull one pull two it made the like, the introduction into the game was phenomenal it was a after that it gets where it's so few and far between that it starts feeling bad yeah. right I, I do think you're right that it's only a few cards like off the top of my head arrow sarah wave she hulk are like the cards you're looking at for series three so and three months and yeah i mean it's it, it it's definitely a generous change from them it's just it's so odd to me that the whole the 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 number one word i remember being associated with the token shop the number one thing that i remember them talking about was player agency agency got thrown out a lot when we're talking about the token shop and now suddenly it's they dialed it back a little bit. You still you get to pick one card a month, but if you wanted to, this is the thing that I think gets me. If you, under this current system, wanted to spend $100 and get Era, Arrow and Sarah, you could probably do that. You could probably do that, right? Like, I don't think necessarily you'd 100% be able to do that, but like you could buy, you could, you, if you were like collection level 500 and you bought like the pro bundle and then just leveled up your collection track, 
I am fairly certain you would be able to do that, right? And now you are that like this is what I think. I think a lot of the complaints about Marvel Snap come from people who want to play budget competitive. They want to be a spike. They want to but they, they, they want to focus on winning. But they want to buy like one deck. They just want to get really good with that one deck and get a good return on investment. They want to spend, they want to like, the, the magic equivalent would be like, you go on TCG player, you run the optimizer a bunch, you get like the cheapest version of your deck and you take it to a PTQ. And there's not really an avenue to be a mid spender in Snap. There's not really an avenue to be like a, a small fish that can compete with the big boys. And I think there needs to be if people want this game to succeed more. I and, think, and especially if we start seeing balance patches more often, exactly being yeah. able to be that that mid spender, which I, I think most people probably want balance patches more often. Like it feels like we've been in the same meta for two months. Like the Sandman change was cool, but outside of that, we didn't really have much impact on what was already running rampant. Mm. Um, but if we start seeing more of those being that mid spender, I, I think becomes even harder. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like, I, I yeah. think there needs to be an avenue for those people to succeed. I think I, I one of the things I think about a lot is how hard it must be to start doing Marvel Snap content creation if you don't have this kind of collection and how what, what kind of upfront cost there must be to do Marvel yeah. Snap content creation and how many awesome content creators we could be missing out on because of that. It's uh, it's not only upfront cost, it's also time gated on that cost, which is crazy. It's like you can't like yeah. at some point it's like you don't you can't it's not a money thing. It's like a time. So you got to farm your account for like. I don't know, a couple months to be able to get the full collection if that's what the the sort of audience base is is looking for. Um, I mean, it's not a coincidence that so many of us are people who played in the beta. You, me, Dara, uh, Cozy, Alex. Like these are like I just named like four people that are way bigger than me. But like, uh, like the what are you like the three you cozy and Alex are probably like the three most watched Marvel Snap YouTubers. Jeff played in the beta, so like Jeff, you cozy, Alex, like Binks you're the people who can one. actually yeah, Binks, Binks played in the beta. Like these are all just like people who played in the beta, and that's it. It's remarkable. I think the only person I can think of, not the only person, the major success story I can think of who didn't play in the beta is Educated Collins. I would say. And Educated Collins, of course, had a fan base from another game that he could like reasonably tap into in terms of bringing bringing Snap. And he was the number one player. And like he could say that. And that helps a ton. Trust me. I know. <laughs> hey, like, uh, I think, so like, I like, think Dexter is another one. Did Dexter play Dexter? The... I, I don't know if he played, Dexter beta. played the beta. I thought oh, Dexter sorry. played the beta. I, I just I don't think he streamed the beta because it Actually, wasn't kind of like, like Regis viewers. Yeah, I think I think Dexter and Regis both played the beta. I would guess Dexter played the beta because his collection level is super high. So there is that. But mm -hmm. I, I thought Dexter played the beta. And yeah. yeah, but like you look at all those people, basically every single one of them played the beta unless Dexter didn't play the beta. But I believe he did. I, I'm, I'm sure he probably did and just didn't yeah. create content. Yeah, I, I could see that. that. Be, that would be my uh, my assumption. I believe Dexter played the beta. And if, if he didn't, he's the he's the major success story. He, he's but like if he did. Only... I don't know if there are any. <laughs> yeah. So before we dive into the sort of the, the mean potatoes of matchmaking mode improvements, quote unquote, uh, so quickly, ultimate variants are leaving the shop in terms of like, I think they get their own section, so they're not going to show. What do you, I just want to get your thoughts on ultimate variants. I've seen uh, sort of in the, the long, the, the long road map, right? Mythic variants. So whatever that, I think that ultimate variants right now are kind of a miss. They're kind of just like, you know, I, I think about the Thor one specifically, and you have that version of a card, like that variant attainable. Um, I think it's, is it the Venomized variant or the Nullified variant? One of those. And just like randomly, the Thor one specifically is ultimate. So now it costs tokens. Do you think that ultimate variants are cool right now? Could you ever see yourself buying one? Or are they just, for me, they feel like a big miss. Like I, they don't have unique animations. It's like, I don't know. What are your thoughts? For on people who are not on the <laughs> on the visual feed of this podcast, TLSG is just shaking his head as soon as he asks the question. <laughs> this is not a question that took any time to answer. It seems so. So for for something to be called like ultimate, which I think maybe along the lines of like mythic, if I'm going to invest that much more than a normal, so that is almost a new card for for that variant. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to invest that much. I, I want it to have some kind of cool effect. So in my head, I think of 
uh, like League of Legends, how they did some of their ultimate skins. So uh, I think DJ Sona was one of them, where it just has this effect on everybody that's in that game. And like it is very known that, that you have that kind of variant. I don't know how they do it other than like a really cool animation, really cool like card effects. And even then, I don't know that it's it's worth that. But but no, I I I couldn't see myself buying one. Yeah, um, with how much it currently costs. Well, speaking of uh, speaking of Dexter, he's like the only person I've ever seen that freaking buys these things on Twitter because he does like like challenges for it. Um, but um, yeah, right now ultimate variants I feel like a big miss. They're like just like this random this random version of a variant that already exists in other cards, but now the Thor is that, or the Gamora, it's hopefully they do better. Maybe that's what mythic variants are. All right. Matchmaking mode improvements. I'm going to read through this. So, um, probably take like a minute, but we're going to, we're going to get it all out there. So they said, we've been hearing your feedback about ranked mode and we agreed it's time to make some changes. Ranked mode is a tough feature to get right. And we want to find the right balance through some additional iteration, we're making a few updates before our next season that will address issues with some players feeling unable to progress or players, players that feel they are not facing worthy opponents. Matchmaking algorithm. We're approving our matchmaking algorithm to create a higher quality match or create higher quality matches for all players, including an update that will prevent players from matching against an opponent that's more than 30 ranks away. Infinite MMR floor. When someone reaches infinite rank, we'll take a snapshot of their MMR matchmaking rating. For the rest of the season, their MMR cannot fl- fall below that value. This changes this changes to address players that could intentionally lose more games at, at infinite rank floor to drop their MMR for next season. You'll be able to... <laughs> wait, this, that's a funny one. You'll still be able to increase your MMR while playing in infinite rank. Infinite versus infinite matchmaking. Players that reach infinite rank will only match against other infinite rank players. All right, so this is a quite a can of worms to unopen. Initially, you see it, you're like, those kind of look like good changes, but I actually think that like without the detail here, these might be bad changes. Uh, what are your you thoughts? You mind if I go first on this one? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> Chomping at the bit. Uh, I, uh, okay. So I think they're all good, but I do think they're aimed more. Like if I, looking at these changes, the sense I get is, these changes uh, can best be summed up in I really don't want Reddit to complain anymore. Mm. That's how I read these, right? Like, these are changes where, like, like the, people love complaining about, like, oh, I'm actually an infinite player. I'm ranked 60. And it's like, you know, that's the consequence of the, the split between MMR and rank, right? Like, it's a consequence of the fact that MMR is no longer tied to rank. They're making it a little more tied to rank in this in this way. But, like, fundamentally what they're doing is they're just, like, uh, we're getting rid of that happening. <laughs> like, we saw your Reddit post. We saw your Reddit post where you said, I saw I played someone with an infinite card back. I, by the way, I cannot wait for, uh, I, I literally, I cannot wait for this because the bots have a bunch of the infinite cosmetics. Mm-hmm. I cannot wait for someone to be like, I had to play an infinite player. I'm only ranked 50. And then a screenshot of like the person named like, I don't know, Eleanor, Robert. <laughs> i can't wait for that that's inevitable by the way they need to they need to actually kind of think about that because that will happen if any of them ever queue into the bots right like that is absolutely going to happen and i think there's also this like this sort of it fixes some problems Mm -hmm. i don't really mind it uh if they mean what they say about infinite players only playing infinite players and that means no bots (laughs) I'd be overjoyed, oh, but I, I kind of I, I I want something explicit on that before I trust because I don't think they've ever officially mentioned that bots exists outside of the like the help channels, right? Like ask the devs, Steven and Ben have confirmed it, but and they've confirmed sort of what they do. So that's how we know they see the RNG. That's how we know that they see uh, the outcomes of your play before you play it. And it's also how we know that they don't see your hand or anything like that. Um, but they've never mentioned it in official communication, so I wouldn't expect them to mention it here. I, and until they do, I have absolutely no idea what this change means for me. Yep. So I think without it coming alongside something like global matchmaking, mm-hmm. I, I think they're, they're good changes, but so for, so since infinite can't re match against anybody, that's not infinite. 70 through 99.9 is going to be this weird, I I think it's going to be a a very different climb now rather than what it is now because you're only going to be matching other people that that aren't infinite. So I 
I think that has to mean bots if we don't somehow have more players that are in that kind of mid rank range. Mm -hmm. And then uh, infinite, I'm hoping that it, I don't know. I'm hoping that somehow they, they widen the the brackets so that you match into actual people. Uh, Otherwise it's going to be, otherwise it's going to be more of the same. Yeah. Um, So if once you hit infinite and you're going into like this different queue, Hopefully they look at that. Uh, they said like skill rating is something that's going to be visible after infinite. Yeah. So there's oh. a there's a couple I didn't read out, which were the infinite rank revamp. Um, yeah. Which yeah. is there's the like rank a, one is going to be a hella bot. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's the best player in the game is a bot playing hella. There's a so there's yeah there's going to be a ranked leaderboard, which is that's a great change. Um, for for us because now we can do something after infinite um there's also a skill rating score i'm just going to read this out real quick this score is your personal skill rating score it's similar to matchmaking rating you're able to see how your skill rating score changes after each match um if you're more interested in increasing your personal skill from season to season this is the number for you and then lastly leaderboard rank your friends your friend has always claimed the best marvel stat player well now we'll find out this is the leaderboard number based on the ranking order of each infinite player skill rating score we're fine-tuning the experience for visuals for a new infinite rank ecosystem and currently scoping it out or hoping to release it as soon as possible um quickly at the beginning uh for like the first few things where it's like you can't you're only ranking or queuing against people 30 ranks array infinite mmr floor infinite versus infinite matchmaking all of this all this has to me without the explicit um sort of uh uh explanation of like what boss will look like all this says more bots to me all this says more bots because it's stricter matchmaking parameters which means more bots right and i actually think that the infinite rank or the infinite grind from 70 to 100 unless there's an agree like there's egregiously more bots because there's less players i think it'll actually be harder <laughs> like i think it'll be harder i think that people try a lot harder 70 to 100 than they do post infinite where they're trying out decks they're having more fun doesn't mean some of the infinite players aren't playing the best decks and trying to win every game but i don't think that infinite players are really the toughest matches that you'll have from 70 to 100 i think it's other players trying to get that as well because they're not willing to drop games um the funniest thing i saw here by the way was not being able to lose games in infinite to drop your mmr for the next season so this is just particularly funny for someone like km who gets stuck in bot elo and now you can't even lose games to get out of it if that i did think about that i did i did wonder about that where it's just like am i now no longer able to tank yeah if they're like is my account like is it is it do i have to like when these changes go live, are these the ones that are expected with the patch? Yeah. Well, it says this is happening before uh, the next season. So, so whatever that means. So, so I should tank right. now is yes. what I'm hearing. <laughs> like I should spend right now just throwing away 75 ranks just because if I don't, it's like if they, if they don't reset MMR enough, I'm going to be here forever. Forever. And you can't yep. get out of it. You'll be stuck. And Hopefully, if for some reason, Infinite well, at least I can go for one. <laughs> you can go for number one. <laughs> and if they, one. if the bots are still prevalent in Infinite, then I don't. Even if you're number one, KM best, I don't mean this in any, any no. It's disrespect. totally meaningless. Um, if they don't fix it, it's number one is just whoever grinded the most high right. key games from the whoever abused the bots the most. Whoever mm-hmm. who yeah, and I hate that already. That's kind of right. how it is right now. It that's sucks. What, yeah, that's what the highest Infinite rank is right now, right? It's yep. Just, yep. And so hopefully some some somewhere they are fixing that portion in the infinite, which I think would make for a much better introduction into the leaderboard, into everything that's coming along with it. So that would remove your fear of dropping MMR. MMR, I think the the reason for the ceiling is that I think the, the Agatha like season pass farm bots. Yes. So that you that go into why. just like garbage ELO that is only mer- matching against bots and then you can abuse that. And so I think that addresses that piece. I, I like that portion, but I didn't think of it because I'm still in like, you know, the, the actual player ELO. Mm-hmm. I didn't think about KM Best and being permanently stuck in a, in a bot like match forever if somehow they don't address how no. many bots are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe Conquest infinite. will fix it. Yeah. <laughs> It'll, uh, maybe I'll wait three months. But yeah, they need to do something about this, I think, for me at least. Well, yeah, and I think that like there, there's a there's a counter argument there where it's like, okay, the game isn't like their changes and their game isn't made for the top 0.001%, which is KM. And I would make the argument that it should be because their top 
content creators, their top streamers are all liable to fall into that super bot elo, right? Where you you sort of exit the player base in infinite and you enter bot elo. And that is a terrible freaking look for the game. You don't actually have to be like fucking incredible to do it. You don't have to be trying to get to get into bot elo in order to get into bot elo. I know Dara hit it accidentally on his alt. <laughs> he wasn't even trying to do it. He just hit it accidentally. And it's just like, oh, well, okay then, fine. Yeah. So I think all honestly, all of these changes are probably good if they just add one more sentence in there, which is no bots after infinite. Yep. Yep. After no that, bots. I think everything is a very yeah, a very positive change. No mm -hmm. bots after infinite. Just 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 let me do matchmaking. This is the other thing with conquest is it gives since the battle mode, you can put up with longer matchmaking timers. And hopefully that means that we'll be able to not play bots there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Especially if it's for medals and like exclusive rewards. I would I would hate bots in, in mm -hmm. that regard. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, if they had bots in there and it was abusable or you're getting scammed by them on your third win, like all of that, like they're not going to get it. Like they will get a lot of negative feedback. So I, I would think that anybody that would consider making these decisions would be smart enough to know that like, okay, there's a couple no goes on this system. And like, if these things happen, we're going to, you know, really piss off our entire player base do you guys have any particular thoughts on skill base skill skill rating score so after each game you have this sort of mmr number that's going up and down um do you think that's going to be good do you think that will make some people feel negative right because they're feeling like it now it's kind of like it's less i would say it's more direct right like you're actually seeing the number go down directly every time um i i just know that a lot of games uh that exist now and in the past have avoided this kind of old school MMR system, um, kind of like this chess MMR system, because it can be so <sighs> stressful. I'm interested to see how it uh, it'll let us measure how big their reset is, I think. Yeah, like I, I'm interested in that. But other than that, I, I, it's, I think it's a weird choice. Uh, probably should just be for people after infinite, because otherwise it devalues the purpose of the ranks. If I get deranked and my skill rating store is still higher than everyone else's, What's the point of ranking? Yeah. It feels redundant with the leaderboard too, to me. A little bit. Yeah. It's like they're both kind of the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And so then if your skill is higher than, than the leaderboard, yeah, I could, I could see it being and feeling redundant. Mm -hmm. I, I like a little bit of agency on like knowing that I'm improving though. So I, I think I'm probably in the, not in the, not in the majority on this one, but um, I, I like the idea of being able to kind of gauge like, Okay, I'm really focusing on not throwing away games and like snapping more conservatively, more aggressively, whatever I think I might need to be able to do to better myself as a mm -hmm. player, being able to see a direct result of that rather than, you know, maybe it's just that this person that's number one on the, on the leaderboard grinded more than I did this season. I, I think having a number that's going to be able to be tied to it, but what affects it? And if that truly means I'm playing better, I, I it is kind of where I, I get curious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, so that sort of wraps up our, you know, the changes. I would say in total, I think this is more than I expected. It's a lot more effort than I expected. There's more transparency than I expected. Uh, we should expect this level of transparency and effort from Second Dinner, but just from playing digital card games in the past, you know, I'm surprised. Like these changes, they came relatively fast. I think that they're robust, except for, you know, talking about bots, and they could potentially fix our current system. So I do want to applaud Second Dinner for. You know, putting in the effort and, uh, you know, getting ahead of the ball. Do you guys have any sort of closing thoughts on all of these changes and this sort of near future of Marvel Snap? So I think depending on how the implementation goes, um, these could be either really big or really, really bad. Um, I, I think I think they all sound really great. Um, like, I'm really excited for conquest mode. I'm excited mm -hmm. for having a, a different like number to strive for and just different ways to to measure um i think all of that's phenomenal but if if it doesn't go well i could see negative backlash for it i'm i'm of the mind that i think it'll be released i think it'll be decent but i think there will be room for improvement um and as long as they continue to like garner that feedback from the player base uh, i I'm, I'm excited for, for what that means for you know the next couple months and then what they come up with after that even mm -hmm. okay I'm I think that the major 
issues with this are going to be how it's received and how it's implemented. I mean, I think my number one issue on every single one of these, you know, people are going to talk, say it's the bots. It's not the bots. My number one issue is card acquisition because no one is going to get up to my level if they can't play the game and they start quitting at CL 1000 because I'm stomping them. I think Mm -hmm. that sucks. That's my number one issue, card acquisition, and I hope that they did enough to address it here. That is my major, my major issue. Yeah, I would say they didn't, even though it's an improvement, you know, like uh, it's still it's still the same stuff with series four, series five, um, still the same problems. We're still in a we're still at the in the realm of prohibitively expensive. And, you know, I think that we're we're just going to keep they're going to keep toning it back. I think that they're going to progressively keep doing this. I don't think that we're anywhere close to the optimal system, but I will say, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, we are making progress, which is nice. Yeah, I mean, it is it is getting better. I will say that much. Yeah. All right. Well, TLSG, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, It's great to have a conversation with you. Um, I'm keen to see sort of the evolution of your content as some of these changes come in with the daily with the daily snap videos for everybody listening. Can you tell them where to find you and what you're up to sort of these days? Yeah. So right now um, I'm streaming on twitch.tv slash TLSG snap. Um, I made the transition to live stream over there and it's been phenomenal. Uh, all of my daily videos are on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's TLSG. Forgot my channel. It's TL. <laughs> we're leaving that in. We're leaving You're it leaving in. It. It's, we're leaving this in. This is not getting cut. It's at TLSG Marvel Snap. I, I couldn't remember if I kept the Marvel in there or not. Um, but on YouTube, it's at TLSG Marvel Snap that you can find all of my content. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see kind of what, what Cam said, where the players go. And so whether that means that it evolves more into like conquest style builds, ladder builds, I think it'll create some kind of maybe division or just some variety in what content creators can can make. Mm, definitely. And a little bit of housekeeping for us. We did have a new review this week. This was from two underscore gorillas. They said, I've been looking for some longer form discussions of competitive marvel snap and this is just what i've been looking for i have lots to learn excited to tune in again appreciate the review to gorillas and if you want to get your review read on the podcast you can go to rate this podcast.com slash snapshot um, there's a video version of this on youtube at youtube.com slash at the underscore snapshot hit that like and subscribe right there i think we're like 50 away from 1000 so really really close i'm on twitter at brendan apg cams at cam best ms and i believe tlsg is at TLSG snap, if I remember that correctly. Yep, yep. <laughs> don't have my don't have my overlay right now. And KM, you are streaming on Twitch. What is your what's your current schedule? KM Best MS, Monday through Saturday, 6 p.m., 10 p.m. Straightforward. Very straightforward. I'm actually gonna do a special Sunday stream this week because I took Thursday off. So I'm gonna make it up with a Sunday stream. Uh actually only a little bit after I record this. Is that breaking kayfabe? Am I allowed to tell them that we recorded this on a Sunday? Or do we have to do we have to do we have to edit that out? Um no. <laughs> speaking of I also have one uh bit of housekeeping here. I think people should know. I was the first person to ever be banned in TLSG's Twitch stream. The one I was and the only first one. The I'm the only, only person who has ever been banned from TLSG's Twitch stream. Maybe we shouldn't advertise that you're the only one. Because then we're going to get people coming in aim, aiming at and try to get banned. banned. Yeah, no, because <laughs> yeah, it's going to be it's going to be the guys who impersonate me on ladder are going to start impersonating me on Twitch now. Hey, I'm Cam Best. Can you ban me? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> the That's amount, right. <laughs> the amount of Cam Best and Cam Best derivatives I ran into after last week's episode is it's astounding. Wild. It's astounding. It's, it's, it, it is an astonishing <laughs> number of like Cam Best, Cam Worst. <laughs> like, there's 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 a lot of there's a lot of uh, KM impersonators out there. Uh, shout out to all the KM impersonators. I hate every single one of you. Um. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, and yeah, TLSG, thank you so much again. We'll see you yeah, all. Yeah, thank you for having me. Next thank week. you.